What is up, Facebook land? Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. And before I introduce my man, Andre Young, I want to first dedicate a show, as I always do. Um, and it would be stupid of me not to dedicate the show to all the mothers out there. Yesterday mm. was Mother's Day. Um, I have been blessed with two mothers in my life. Um, my birth mother, my biological mother, my, my hero, Louise Jones, um, has sacrificed more than any human being should ever sacrifice for another person. Um, she raised me and my brother working two, two, three jobs until we were 10 or 11, 12 years old when she met my stepdad. And, and then, you know, she, she brought him in safely into our lives and knowing that he was going to be a great role model for us. Um, and she's just been a pillar of strength, um, for so many people, including me. Um, then I, I was lucky enough to, to be adopted by another family, um, the Gilroy family and, and and mom Gilroy has been like a second mom to me. She's treated me like her own and allowed me to be um, part of their family and, and treats me like one of the kids. And and I love her for that as well. And uh, obviously I'm married to the greatest woman on the planet, my wife, Lauren, who literally makes sure that everything runs smoothly because I am functionally incapable of keeping track of so many things. And I don't know how she does it, but she's figured it all out. To where she can have, she knows when they didn't take their morning vitamin. She can tell you when the next doctor's appointment is, when, what their grades are at what time, who's got to go to the dentist. My kids would be toothless, hungry, <laughs> naked, and smelly because I would forget everything. So um, to every mother out there, uh, thank you for what you do. You are the unsung heroes. Um, you know, I am truly honored to know such amazing women and that they are influencing. I'm a mama's boy tr through and through. My mom is, my mom looks at me and she says, I need you on there tomorrow. No questions asked. Um, so thank you moms for everything that you do. Now a little bit about my man, Andre. He's a, a Berks County guy, lives out in Reading, originally from Philly, uh, played college football. He is an entrepreneur. He's a, he's a speaker. He's a, uh, owns a business that helps people learn how to balance their life and their home and and their families. And, and he just teaches people how to find the best within them so that they can take that out into their lives and, and share it with others. Um, I don't want to give out too much about him because I want him to share that and I want it to be unique and, and authentic at the moment. So without further ado, my man, Andre Young. What's up, buddy? Oh, well, thank you, Matt, for having me on. And hi, world. It's great to be here. Matt, that was awesome what you said about moms. I echoed that. Echoed that. Happy belated Mother's Day to everybody out there watching. And, uh, you know, it's just I, I feel just tremendously blessed to be able to get to do what I get to do every day. So thank you have it, for having me on the show. It's awesome, man. I'm, I'm happy you came on. You know, we we connected through um, through Facebook, through some mutual friends in the speaker world. And uh, I'm really thankful that that you're on. I think your your business is unique. I think what you do and how you do it is unique to you. Um, we have a lot in common, including the same godly like head. Um, <laughs> I just say that God not only made so many perfect heads, the rest he put hair on. So <clears throat> we're 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 not bald by choice. We're bald because God said your head was perfect. There you go. So I know you've seen the show. Um, I don't want to give you too much preparation time, so I'm gonna get right after it. Sure. So the first question and the only question I ask with any planning and preparation is who is Andre Young? Wow. Well, I love the question and it's a big question. And that's one of the concepts of what I what I do, because when I go into a place or organization or a team and I talk about us evolving in all of the roles that we play, I say our four P's. So as a person, partner, parent and professional. So I'm a lot of different things. I mean, uh, first, I'm me. I'm Andre. And I love that part. I'm also a husband. I'm a father of three with one in the oven. So it's uh, that's a blessing as well. And I'm honored to be able to get to do that every single day being a parent. Uh, entrepreneur, I didn't know that that was going to happen. I was an employee and I was a mental health therapist for 19 years. I thought I would retire doing that. I love doing that. Uh, but there came a point in my life where everything that I have lived, everything that I saw and everything that I created just empowered me and pushed me into doing this. Um, so long story short, I kind of sum it all up. Uh, I was an athlete for a long time, like you had mentioned. So I played uh, high school football, but I only played one year. I was a knucklehead in some ways and paid the price and consequences for that. Um, but football saved my life. 
where it gave me a daily passion and a daily grind that was just different and allowed me to earn a scholarship to college and play there and do that there. I still didn't like going to class very much. It, you know, it was still <laughs> club college and a lot of trouble that I, you know, that way. But I graduated college and I still had aspirations of playing, uh, started working, you know, had a child on the way. And I was so frustrated looking back that I spent all of those years in the classroom and I graduated a little bit smarter, but so ill prepared for everything and anything life was throwing my way. I wasn't prepared. There was no class on how to be a dad. There was no class on how to be a better boyfriend or a future husband. There was no class on how to be a really good employee or an entrepreneur or forward thinking. And there was just no class on it. And uh, I, I graduated a little bit smarter, like I said, and a better athlete, but ill prepared for everything else. So, you know, a big part of my business when I work with the youth is, you know, not on my watch. And I've had, you know, people say, well, you know, you should just focus on one thing because, right, you know, you're doing a great job with employees and companies. I said, no, because I've been that student that needed it and it wasn't there. And I didn't even know what I needed, but it wasn't there. Uh, and I've been that athlete and I know what I needed. You know, I didn't know what I needed, but it wasn't there. And whether I was me developing or thinking what I wanted to be or thinking about uh, sports. And this is one of the most dangerous things when we talk about success. So I work with athletes or you ask somebody or you work with companies. You ask people their definition of success. And they're going to tell you that one thing that they think if they chase hard enough and catch it will make them happy. And that is the scariest definition in the world because one of three things is going to happen with our success or our definition of it. You're either going to catch it and you're not the person you need to be to enjoy it. And I've been through that, being married and divorced and getting the house and the 2.5 kids and the $50,000 car sitting in the driveway. I had all of that. So I got that definition of success that I had at that time, but I wasn't the person I needed to be to enjoy it and keep it. Or you get your definition of success and it's not what you thought it was going to be. I became a professional football player at 30 years old. So it was small time professional arena league football, but I did it. I made it, you know, and I got there and it wasn't what I liked. I didn't enjoy the lifestyle. You know, I'm 30 with three kids and, you know, living a lifestyle that I would have enjoyed at 23. So now you got your definition of success. It wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Now you're depressed and lost. Or you get your definition of success. You're exactly who you need to be. And then life is going to come and gut punch you and change everything. And it's not going to matter anyway. So it, it became really important that how do we expand our plan A? How do we expand our definition of success? What is our dream lifestyle like in all of the different roles that we play? Not just that one thing that we think will make us happy, which is momentary anyway. Um, so, you know, who I am is that. And I'm, I'm really big on being a uh, uh, just teaching and growing every day. And uh, whether that's through writing and I'm an author, whether that's through speaking as a speaker or through my company where we go to do on site programs and seminars, that's that's, you know, who I am. And if I can do that with my kids, with my wife, with me and everybody that I come in, in contact with and positively you know, that's, I love it. Dude, I, there's some, my mind's a little bit blown right now. We got like 75 directions I can go in. So, <laughs> but I like, I love finding out, like I can Google you and find out where you are right now mm -hmm. and come up with a picture in my head of who Andre Young is based on articles or your book or videos. I can sort of piece that together, but I can't piece together how you got here. Mm. I don't know how to find out more about Andre on the internet about growing up in Philly or your relationship with your, your family or struggles and, and things you've gone through in your life growing up. And I think it's important when you see somebody successful and you see somebody who's, who seems to figure it out the, the, the metrics to life right. and understands that there's this balance, this, this fine balance and understanding the different strengths and weaknesses within the different aspects of your life. I think it's important to know, how that knowledge was gleaned. Wow. So let's go back. Yeah, we can go back. Philadelphia. And let's talk about what it was like growing up. What was your home life like? What was it like in school? Oh. What was it like um, socially? 
<laughs> well, socially, I remember being a young kid, and if my brother and people who know me watching, like I was a nerd kid when I was when I was younger. I was in the house. I like drawing comic books. I like painting. I sold a painting when I was thirteen years old. I didn't get into sports until late, uh, probably about fourteen, actually, where I fell in love with football. But I stayed in the house. When my mom wanted to punish me, she would kick me out the house. <laughs> and my brother's completely the opposite. He was the street runner. He was constantly outside. Um, and it wasn't until you know I, I started to maybe 10th grade, because I went to the School of uh, Engineering and Science. So mm -hmm. George Washington Carver High School of Engineering and Science in Philly, real smart school. So I went there for my ninth and 10th grade years. Um, wasn't in the sports, didn't know what I was doing. And I left there in 10th grade with four F's, two D's and a C. <laughs> and I'm laughing at it now. I still remember my mom looking at the report card and she's looking like she's never seen the letter F before. And she's like, you know, what is that? You know, and I didn't understand because I went to school every day at that time. And I realized now that I have ADD. I have a really hard time learning things that I don't care about. And then sitting in that row seat and just, it was like, wah, wah, you're talking to me and I just could not hear it. I could not understand you. It was like another language. And I just, I went there every day. I, I wasn't cutting class, I wasn't cutting school and I, four F's, two D's in the C. So I transferred to my uh, neighborhood school was, which was Martin Luther King. And that was an experience. Um, where the, the neighborhood school and it's just massive amount of people and so many different things going on. And the, the knock on city schools is that there's not a lot of positive things going on. And I really would like to stand up for that uh, because there is. But you got to care enough and know enough and even be willing to ask how to do it and where is it? Because there's not a lot of people jumping out to say, hey, here, here it is. And, uh, you know, I me and my friends started doing our own things. And I admit I had a ball, but I paid for it. My grades paid for it. And, you know, I disrespected myself and my family looking back into it, all of the things that I got into back then. Um, but football, the interest in football saved my life. And what I really understood that was different that I did, that I didn't have an understanding of why I was doing it or that it was going to make a difference. But whatever I loved, I did daily. Thank goodness it was positive, <laughs> you know, but whatever yeah. I love, I did it daily. Nobody had to tell me to be out at the hottest part of the day doing football workouts because that's when you're going to play. So play, if you want to play at 12 o'clock, then you practice at 12 o'clock. And I was out there doing that. I fell in love with weights early uh, and, and lifting and take, taking care of my body and doing that. And just that daily agenda of getting better and what I just enjoyed just kept making me more and more successful. So uh, when I was in 10th grade, I'm, I still remember the day before the first game. So I'm the starting running back, everything I've ever wanted and, and dreamed of for that time, or at least I dreamed of for the past year was here. So my coach comes over to me and says, son, you got four F2Ds in the C. You can't play. And I remember just sobbing like a baby. I sobbed like a baby. And it was one of the biggest lessons and life moments that I'll never forget because it was the first person or thing or life that ever consequenced me that wasn't a parent. And it was something I couldn't argue with. I did it and I had to eat it. Uh, and I went out to play semi-pro football with a bunch of 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds. And it was wound, wound up being one of the coolest experiences I was 15 years old. I was a running back. We had authentic uniforms, so we played for the Giants. You look like the Giants. You played the Steelers. They look like the Steelers. Uh, and it was just an amazing uh, thing, and I'm glad it did because I realized that I can take their hits. I can give those hits, and I was everything about 150-something pounds, you know. But don't let your circumstances get in the way of your dream. And I learned a long time ago in which I've now been able to verbalize is there's other marriages that we got to marry. We got to first marry instead of worrying about who we're going to marry and making vows to somebody else. How about we marry ourselves first? And I remember making some vows to me, you know, marry your dream, but not the path, you know, and then marry your why. 
And once we can do that and the earlier we can do that and we live that daily, boom. You know, so I played my senior year and you asked how my neighborhood was. And I'm so glad I, I'm able to gift my kids with this experience. But my neighborhood was, you know, it, it was divided. I mean, you go one way down the, up the street and it was an OK neighborhood. You go down the street and it was like the wild, wild west. You know, a mobile police station on the corner that couldn't move. Uh, I remember <clears throat> crack cocaine first came out, and I remember it sweeping through our community and it looking like the night of the living dead. People you just knew a year ago, six months ago, the good people are now stretched out in the middle of the street. You know, so just being able to see all of these different things, and I used to say that I didn't have a lot of role models, you know, back then. When I look back, I have to forgive my speech and I hope that people forgive me. I, I did have great roles. I had my mom. I had my dad. You know, my parents were together up until I was about 14 and 15 and then things. But I had that. And they instilled a lot of a, uh, you know, don't do this, do this or go up the street instead of down the street. And they they instilled that, that path in, in me and my brother early that I never really forgot. And, uh, you know, my mom did a fantastic job of always being there and available. So happy belated Mother's Day to you, mom. Uh, just being there and available and willing and ready to listen to anything and everything. And I can't believe some of the stuff that I told my mom. And my dad did an awesome job of being a rock uh, of patience. And although I couldn't understand it then, being able to look back and see all of the things that he did and didn't have to do, given the circumstances, and just be like, wow, like that you know, he was a silent, uh, a silent giant, a silent superhero, you know, and sometimes it takes maturity to look back and see that, you know, so. That's, you don't, and I, I'm going to say this with all delicateness. Growing up, we're about the same age. You're how old, 48? 42. 40, 42. All right. So I'm a little bit older than you. But growing up in that era, especially growing up in an urban environment and being black, having both your parents at home was not necessarily the norm. It wasn't like on our street though, I tell you what, that it, cause it's not. <laughs> um, and looking back, a lot of my friends didn't have their fathers in their lives. And, uh, but on our street, for some reason, I don't know, but a lot of the fathers were, were there. Uh, but then, you know, divorce happens and things happen, but uh, you know, you're right. That does, you know, that is prevalent. And it's so important that, in our schools. And when now when I go back and I'm speaking at a high school next week and I came up with something called the leader seven, and it's going to be the next, next book that comes out. Cause I was writing the last chapter of seven ways to lead. And I said, Oh my goodness, like this is freaking huge. You know, it's a book all of its, of its own. It's a seminar. It's a movement all of its own. And I tell, you know, a lot of the teachers, I'm like, listen, you are, you know, some of these kids real parent, or they're here six, seven, eight hours a day. Like you're some of their parent or their secondary parent or their family, especially in inner city, because I was a mental health therapist in inner city schools and in suburban schools. And, you know, anytime you say every or all, you're wrong. Right. But what I found in the suburban schools, a lot of the kids look at the teachers as tools. You are a tool for me to get knowledge from or get something from and then move on and propel. But in the urban schools, it's more of, you are somebody I, I need or I want, or you're a connection. You're 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 somebody I, I need emotional connection from. It's a and constant language. What's that? It's a constant. Yeah, and it's uh you know, it's something that they may not have mm -hmm. in their home or in their neighborhood. So our language that we use in the leader seven says there's seven languages. There's seven languages that employees, students, and athletes need to hear, want to hear, and benefit most from hearing from their leader, whether it's their employer, their teacher, or their coach. And as leaders, we need to be able to speak all seven. But each piece person that's following you has a top one or two. I want to teach you how to explain these seven in 30 seconds, get your answer in 30 seconds, and then I teach how to apply it in casual conversation, because that casual conversation, especially in the urban schools, matters so much. But then in those tough situations, because if you're going to be a leader of any sort and you can't have a tough conversation, you're not going to be leading much. So or who you're leading is going to be scary, <laughs> you know, so 
that's really important going back to the high schools. And I love being able to get to do that because I was an employee too. And how we are being spoke to and how we speak and how we hear and how we can grab an ear really matters so much for a culture of a school, a culture of a company. And then also teaching in my seven ways to love, how to love up. Because the students need to start loving up on the, on the, on the teachers, you know, because they're in a tough spot. And if you're an employee, listen, middle management is tough. Teach a frontline employee to start loving up and catch middle management doing good because the truth is they're dealing with a whole lot more stuff for not a whole lot more money and about 200 more emails a day. So how do we start loving up? Because we're already expected to love down. And when we start meeting that in the middle with reciprocity, wow. You know, but language is so important. So I love where I came from. Uh, it's made me so much of, of who I am. And I remember, and maybe people out there watching have been through this too, especially if you've been from um, a, a one culture to another culture, you first go through this, I love this part of me. But then I got to a point where I love this part of me, but now I got this part of me too. And then learning how to do this, and then you just become this. You know, so going through that journey and then how to do it successfully is very, very important because it's not always an easy transition for people. It's, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of youth mentoring and I, and I go into schools as you do and and a little bit of a different role, but <clears throat> I'm working in, and I'm sure you knowing the, the problems that the city of Reading has always had and still has. Um, Pottstown has very similar um, issues and actually just it's funny how you were talking about the seven types of communication. I literally just had almost verbatim talk with, with a woman today. There's, there's a big meeting tonight in Pottstown trying to um, create a community center. I'm, I'm sort of mentoring and advising it, this group of people um, that, that want to create this community center and um, trying to teach them how to talk to the different people they're going to be speaking with, the politicians, the, the community people, the schools. Like You have to speak to them all in a different way based on the way that, that the things that they want to hear and how they listen. I said, you can't just, you can't tell the same story to everybody in the same exact way in order to get them to understand what it is you want them to understand. And it's just amazing how, um, how difficult it is for people sometimes to utilize um, communication skills and, and adapt their communication skills based on the environment they're in and who their, their audience is. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, what's your intent? Is your intent positive and clear? And then finding out what do people want? So many times as leaders, we're focused on giving our dream and our vision. And that's great if it reflects their dream and their vision. <laughs> Have we even stopped to ask what their dream and vision is? You know, uh, what do they want to get out of this? And then being able to, you know, how do we do this? This is my ideas and this, let's have a conversation. So I go and I whether I'm talking to a high school or college, uh, a CEO or a company, and it's, I know what I do great, but I need to know what you need from me or what you feel like the issue is. And now let's start talking the same language, you know, and you know, the leader seven, it, it, it does apply across the board. It's the seven things here. Now, if your top two are great, and my top two are the same, it's going to be easy for us to have a conversation. And one of the things I share with people, I said, what is your top two? Especially when I'm talking to leaders, what is your top two? Okay, great. So you're going to connect so great with those people who have that same top two. What's your least favorite two? Or what's the two you don't even concern yourself with? That's going to be your troubles population right there. So how do we start to upgrade that and teaching how to do that casually and in those tough conversations and putting some preface statements in? Um, to, say, to, to, to prepare you for the tough conversation that's going to happen. Might not happen for six months. Might not happen for a year, but I guarantee you it's coming. So I, I, I love what I get to do. It's an awesome, awesome experience. So do you do you take the, you know, the one of the cool things about growing up with both parents and growing up in an urban environment and growing up in a city that has neighborhoods, that has distinct ethnic and cultural sections, um, and, and being in going from science and engineering to MLK yeah. <laughs> and having those two separate worlds, cause they are 100% two separate worlds. Not everybody, some people, you know, some people grow up the, the, the school of hard knocks mm -hmm. and that's how they got their, their battle wounds and that prepared them for life. 
some people go through life with all the luxuries and all the tools at their disposal and allow them to become better human beings and grow from it because they've, they've been laid the path in front of them on how to be successful. Mm -hmm. I think you kind of had the best of both worlds where you had a mom and dad at home who were supportive and provided you with guidance and, and had expectations on you. And then you also had the urban lifestyle, seeing what was around you on a daily basis that whether you wanted to or not, you had to witness it and had to be exposed to it. Of course. So I, how did those, those paths, those things that you had in your life, how did they build you to be who you are today? What was, was there an aha moment? Cause I know you said early on that you were a chucklehead sometimes in high school and, <laughs> and, you, and you party hard and had a good time in college and you came out a little bit smarter. Was there a moment when the switch happened, when oh, yeah. all that, when all that happened in your life, all the things you've been through every high and low, every stupid mistake, every fun time that should have been a learning time. When was that moment? Um, I've, I've had a, a few. So, cause one wouldn't do it justice. I have the biggest one that I'll share with you. Uh, but I, but I told you, I mentioned where, you know, I couldn't play, you know, and that, and that was the first time that I was ever kicked in the butt and said, Oh, my actions matter. I have to pay the consequences of these things. Um, when I was in college, uh, I almost failed out a couple of times. I got kicked out of off campus. I was banned from campus. I, like I said, I, and nothing really crazy or, uh, just I and, and a lot of fun. I was a lot of fun, and I remember the dean. He did one of these, or he turned around, and he had my file in his hand, and he was like, "Son, you just can't be on campus anymore." And I was like, hmm. "And we both just acknowledged." Uh, but through my evolution, when I went back to that university and presented my programs, you know, uh, I went to the bathroom before the meeting. This guy comes out the stall. It's him. And we both look at each other and he says, I remember you. And I said, I remember you too. And we both walked into the same meeting and he's the person that signed the contract for us to do work with Kutztown University. It was amazing. Um, another big life event was, um, was twofold. And this was big and this is really personal. I don't even talk about this much, but it was really personal. I was 30 years old and I went out for a, a friend's bachelor party. And I was drinking and uh, police officer, uh, her, I was harassed. Um, and I remember he pushed me and without thinking, I was, oh my God, and without thinking, and I was drinking without thinking, I pushed him back. And it was like, uh, immediately like, oh my God. And I was facing six months in jail. Um went to court, everything was, the police officer said, hey, listen, you know, this is what happened. All charges dropped, not an issue. At that moment though, I had to say, wait a minute, because I told you my high school, I told you my college, and now I'm telling you this. And the only thing that was in common with any of that was alcohol. And I made a decision that day. I said, well, do I have a problem with alcohol? Or do I become a problem with alcohol? And I really had to really sit back and look at that. And I stopped drinking, boom. And I realized I didn't have a problem with alcohol, but I realized I became a problem with alcohol. So I just eliminated it. And then one day I remember being out, I was younger, I was out. And I'm looking like, wow, is this where I'm at? Is this what I'm doing? Is this the lifestyle I'm living? Or is this is what's fun? And immediately, boom, done, changed. My life just took off and it was just, you know, amazing. But I really had to sit back and that was a very significant event. And that's the first time I ever mentioned that on air. Um, the other part was a divorce. Uh, soon after that, you know, I wound up because I, rem I talk about the different phases of life that I lived in. I, I was in have it all mode where I had it all, all of the things that people would look at. And I tell people all the time, stop judging people's lives on social media and what they're posting. You have no idea what's going on behind that closed door of that nice house or whatever house. So uh, shortly after that was a divorce. And I remember going from that uh, house, you know, house built $50,000 car sitting in the driveway, all of that stuff to a two bedroom apartment with three kids half the time um, and no money, <laughs> you know, and really, I mean, scraping 
to eat a spaghetti for a year and a half because that's all I could afford. And that's when you evolving now started, but it started with men, men evolving now, and then it changed the women evolving now. Cause I knew I said, okay, wait, I'm a good person. And I just, a lot of people don't have anywhere good to go once they decide that they're going to have a better life and they don't have anybody good to do it with. Cause although you have friends, a lot of times we're friends with people who we've been friends with. You know, so you wind up, it becomes too uncomfortable being by yourself. So you slide on back. And that wasn't, that was no longer an option. So when that started, it was more voluntary based. People who wanted more out of life, we could come and do this together. And we had forums and we had events. And it was all about leaving better and not just men's night out or a woman's night out where you come home relieved, but not better. And that's where it all started, but then it evolved because you're competing with people's busyness. And at some point, busy is not going to make you better. You know, you're so busy being bitter, you know, be, you know, busy that you forget to get better. And most people are like, uh, they react like the dentist. When life gets hard enough, when that tooth hurts so bad, then you go run to the dentist. And whether that's for help or to therapy or to church. You know, so why don't we be a little bit more proactive? And what I realized is I couldn't compete with people's busy. So whether you're busy being a CEO, busy being a mom, busy working or busy on the couch, elbow deep in a bag of chips, that's their definition of busy. And you can't compete with that. And even if you do, they're going to come to you as far as, as what they need. And then it's for a season and then they're gone. So I said, well, where are people? People were at work. People are at school and they're on their phones. So reorganizing over the past few years, and we bring our programs to your job, to school, and we have an app. So when I'm not there, I say, let me live in your pocket. So through my experience of being a mental health therapist, through my experiences of being a knucklehead, through my experience of being a boy in a man's body you know, years ago, over a decade ago, through the evolution process of growing and down, wow, okay, this is what I wanted to do, needed to do, should have did. And then when I apply it, it works. And then I do it daily and it works even more. Wow. So doing all of that and putting that all together has just been an amazing experience that has come out through authoring books and then speaking engagements and, you know, uh, what I call work-life harmony and leadership. Because this whole notion of work-life ba work balance, it's not true. It's not always going to be balanced. Not to mention, we live in America, you know, where it's all work. When I was a therapist, I would, used to do marriage counseling and then, you know, people would come in and typically, typically, anytime you say every or all, you're wrong. But typically men would come in and say, well, I work, work, work all the time. I don't understand what the problem is. Contrastly, women would come in, not every or all right, and say, well, my life revolves around the kids. I don't understand what the problem is. You know, so it became very important that we just do a holistic thing and find out what's on the top of our triangle. And I talk about that in my book. What's on the top of your triangle will run your life. And I finally figured out what needs to be on the top of my triangle. And for me, it's twofold. I say, look, it's got to be, it has to be, what's our couple's vision? So I'm remarried, love my wife. Well, baby, if you're watching, I love you. You know, it's, what's our couple's vision? What do we want this to look like going together? Because there's going to be days we walking through heaven. There's going to be times where we walk through hell, but damn it, we need to hold hands in both places. What's our vision? And what's our vision for ourselves? What's my vision for me as a person? And if you're watching this, what's your vision for you as a person, as a partner, as a parent professional? And then what are we doing about that daily? And then on the other side of that triangle is what's, what's faith? If you're a faith-based person, open your faith-based book, read it and do it. It's already written, you know? And, uh, you know, I have more to that triangle, but what's at the top will run our life. That's so true. It's... uh. Yeah, that's why I mean I was I was so intrigued to have you on is because the way you speak and and the method by which you communicate your ideas is very clear in a uh, tangible way that ninety nine point nine percent of the population I don't care what your great education is you can grasp the concepts they're not rocket science <laughs> they're not they're literally everything everybody's heard at some point in time in their life just put into a concise way. So that it, it's a it's a applicable 
and able to be go out and be accomplished. And I think that's the key to any instructional component of anything is, you know, when, when you have a teacher that sucks <laughs> and a teacher that's good, they can teach the same topic yeah. in the same curriculum. And some kids in the one class with a good teacher all getting A's and one with a sucky teacher or not. And, and it's not a matter of the kids being dumb. Right. It's just that the delivery mechanism was tainted. Well, right. And, and you mentioned <clears throat> the connection as well. And I've been very blessed. You asked uh, being on both sides when I was younger. And I've been very blessed to be on both sides of so many things. And it was, I, feel, I personally feel like it's allowed me to connect because I've been. So I've, I've been in uh, inner city living. I've been in suburbs. You know, I've been in the household where there's the, the two parents and told me not to, but then I did it anyway and wind up getting in trouble. So I've been on those sides. You know, I've, I've been an athlete and then I stopped playing and then I returned to being an athlete. I was an employee. I started my business, but I needed both jobs. And then I wound up, uh, you know, at one point I had 12 staff and I'm running a business, but my wife and I built this house, right? So I'm like, well, I still, I need extra, I need income still, you know? So I went back and wound up being the best employee ever because I had employees and I knew what bosses wanted and I knew how to do it. And, you know, it, it was an amazing experience. And then as a business owner and now being self-employed, so I've been a business owner, I've been self-employed, I've been an employee, I've been divorced uh, and then remarried. You know, I've been the younger one. I've been the older one. I've been the one that stayed at home. I've been the one that's come home. And it's just been an amazing experience when we can stop complaining about the life that we've lived. Because the truth is, and I don't mean to minimize anything that anybody or you are out there going through. But we need to know that no matter who you are, there's a million people out there that will trade places with you right now. Back. Right now. So whatever has gone on, whatever is going on, what can you take from it? And I choose to live in my positives and manage my negatives. There are some great things going on that I'm going to enjoy and learn from because we need to learn from our positives too. How did they get positive? How do you keep them positive? But the negatives, you break down and say, okay, what can I control? And what I control, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability daily. And what I can't control, I'm just going to live right. If I live right, even in the face of my negatives, so you don't like your job, well, you still go to it. You don't come in late and then come in late with food. You don't go in late and be complaining about the boss and everybody else. You know what I mean? If you don't like it and you can't control the fact that you can't leave right now, well, one, you can. But just live right. Do all of the things right so when the opportunity does come, you haven't burned that bridge. The things you can control at that job, in that relationship, as a parent, as a person, then do it and do it daily. What are you doing about it? And then what's the good parts about it? How do we maximize that? You know, so a lot of times I just tell people show up and smile. That's one of the first things and most powerful things. And it's free. That's especially being in the inner city. Oh, yeah. Because that's younger. It wasn't safe to smile. And it took a long time to break that and understand that, you know, you know, if you're younger in the inner city and I used to uh, you know, work with clients that worked in the inner city, that lived in the inner city, smiling can make you a target. You look weak. So it took a long time to say, OK, you know, you have to have that face. And I remember going away to Kutztown University and going up there for so long that you start just smiling and you don't have to worry about people, you know, looking over, you know, looking over your shoulder and things like that. And I remember coming home one time and I was smiling and some guy said, what you looking at? I said, look, that was my bad. I forgot where I was, you know, <laughs> but as we mature and get older, look, we don't have to have that. And when we bring that same stoic face or depressed face or that Monday face and I, you know, and it's TGIT, thank God it's today. You know, everybody's waiting for Friday, but Monday has value. Tuesday has value. Wednesday has value. You know, if we could go to work, go to our relationship with a smile. Can you imagine being in a relationship and every time your partner walked through the door to come see you, they look miserable? Eventually, that may make you miserable. You may think they don't want you or not happy, and then it affects your mood for the rest of the night. Add that up day after day, week after week, month after month, decade after decade. What do you think people feel and what culture are you bringing when you bring that into work, when you bring that into school, when we bring that into a team? Power. Dude, here's, 
I'm, I'm ready to go suit up and <laughs> I'm gonna go ask my wife out on a date. I'm going to hide. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go be the best I can be after all that. One last thing I want to talk about before we end the show. I want to talk about being a father. Mm. Um, I think there's, there's not enough out there um, in the podcast world about men being fathers and, and that responsibility uh, that, that we have to, to be there, to be a support system, to be a disciplinarian, to be a, a, a teacher, a role model, uh, a protector, all those, those titles that we have as a father. What are your thoughts of being a father? What is, what's the thing that you love most about being a dad? Oh, um, that's a big question. A couple of things roll through my hot, my mind is one that it's a gift and I love it. And it's not the easiest thing every day. And, uh, you know, you go through, <laughs> I was just joking with somebody. I mean, uh, that 12 to 16 year old phase is like, you love them, but you like, man, help me like you more. What is going on in your world? <laughs> I just want to straight, you know, but, um, uh, the biggest thing that comes to mind is that it's forever. Nobody can take it from you. Relationships don't always work, um, but being a parent is forever. And being able to pour into our children is just an amazing thing. I love every day. I, I, one of the things that I talk about um, is deathbed living. I've been on my deathbed. Uh, February 13th, 2013, you know, I laid on the floor and I was dying. And um, I remember calling my kids in and out of consciousness. I remember calling my kids. I don't remember what I said to them. Uh, but I remember these two thoughts that were going through my mind. And I share this when I speak. The two thoughts that were going through my mind. One, does my wife know how much I love her? And two, did I teach my kids enough that I can die right now and they'd be sad, but they'd be okay? Did I teach them enough? Did I pour enough into them that they'll be okay? And if that's what I was thinking about in death, then that must be what I live every single day. And I love being able to get to do that. So I'm big on dream development. Um, the last chapter of my book, Seven Ways to Love, is called Being a Dream Leader. It's the cherry on top of any relationship. We have to care enough to know the people we care about's dream. So what are my kids' dreams? And how can I help you? What is it that you need for me to be? And sometimes it might be be less of how I am. <laughs> you know, I've had my older son tell me that, look, you know, maybe you could just chill a little bit. You know, my dream has changed, but you got to care enough to ask every now and then because we, we we care enough to ask once. You know, but then we're operating off of that dream. If the dreams change now, we might be being the pushy dad. Do we care enough to know our wife's dream? Your mom's dream. And how can I help you with that? What is it that you need from me? Maybe you need more. Maybe you need less of me to back off. Maybe you need me to connect you with somebody. But what it is, let's let's do it. Um, one of the big things that just happened, and I was just talking about this uh, at an event, uh, that I was shamed into doing better because I knew better, Matt. I knew better. And I wasn't doing enough. Uh, so in the morning, my, my, I wake my kids up and start the day at like 545 or something like that. And my one son has to, he, he lifts weights for the high school for football every day at seven o'clock, sometimes 630. So uh, him and my 11 year old son, we get in the car uh, in the wintertime, it's pitch black, you know, that time in the morning. And he, one of three things is happening. Either they were in the car and no music is on and everybody's just droned out and they're sleeping. Uh, very hard to go into a workout when you just got a car sleeping. So we needed to do something about that. Um, or we're listening to one of the morning shows. Now, I know they could be entertaining and I don't have anything bad to say about the morning shows. And if you out there, public, are loving them, it's great. But it could be a lot of nonsense sometimes. Um, or I love hip hop. I love hip hop. Uh, not always the healthiest thing for our kids to listen to, especially at 630 in the morning. So every now and then I was putting on... Uh, <laughs> short motivational videos. Now I could put my videos on, I put them out, but enough of dad. I mean, they just need a different voice. And part of the things as fathers, we got to get another uh, man or and woman's voice in our kids' head, lives, and heart other than our own. Because sometimes I can see the words hit my kid's forehead and watch it trickle down their face. You know, some of it, way more of it gets in than we think. 
but you can see the words trickle down their head sometimes, you know? So I think it's very important that mothers too, can we get another female voice in our daughter's you know, head other than theirs? You know, so I um, started putting on these short motivational videos. And when I started doing that, and it might be two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, what I heard from the back seat, I heard this. Hmm. It's one of the most powerful sounds that we can ever make as a human being because it means something struck you. You had to think. And what I call them is eyebrow raising moments. Us as speakers and anybody watching this, I challenge how many eyebrow raising moments can you put in your home life, in our work life and at school? How many times can you make somebody go hmm or raise their eyebrow off of something that you said that was powerful? So, you know, I, I heard that from the back seat. Hmm. Then I see my 16 year old son. He's he's not sleeping anymore. He's looking up. He's looking at the video like, who's this? And I just saw it filling them up. And I don't know what it's going to do for them moving forward. I may not ever know the instant that something that they heard or I have said impacts their life when they're out there with their friends or on that team, or, or in my situation, hopefully not getting in trouble younger and all of those things. But I know it's going to happen one day. I just don't, I won't know when it does, but I know it will. So that, that's a, when, when you talk about as a father, what does it mean for me to be a father? It means for me, it's, it's a gift, it's forever, and I get to fill their cup, you know, with, with what I know and what I wish I knew. Uh, but being able to speak their language too. Uh, Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. I think it's the best book on love. Um, you know, it, it, it's the Bible of love, so to speak, you know, and my book, Seven Ways to Love, teaches you how to do things like that every day, you know, but the book was so simple if you get the abridged version. And I remember going through my, uh, you know, we sat at the dinner table. What's your two? What's your two? What's your two? Boom. You know, and it was just an amazing thing. So I, I love being a dad. It is one of the most amazing, amazing things that we can do. And I like to give a, you know all of the dads or relationships and men and women out there. Look, um, it'd be great if all of our relationships can work out or we can work them to work out. It's not always going to be the case. Even in my seven ways to love, look, I say, look, I'm not promising you a great relationship. What I promise you is if you do this, your relationship can get good. If you're if you both do it together or or a community does it together or a workforce does it together, it can get great. But if it doesn't work for whatever reason. You want to put your head on the pillow in peace, knowing you did everything you were supposed to do. That's priceless. So, you know, being a dad, I just want to pour. I just want to pour so much and I want to be able to speak their language so they can get it better. And uh, one day when they're older, I hope to get a phone call like I have to my parents, as I'm sure you have to yours and you guys did to yours. Hey, thank you. Or I get it now. Or wow, I appreciate that. And, that's going to be the best, the best moment in the world. It is. Yeah, it, it really is. And I look forward to getting it from my kids. Uh, you know, I actually saw my daughter years ago. She's 19. But years ago, uh She's hard to raise. She's very, very stubborn, you know, and it's going to take her far in what she chooses to do. But she's, you know, was what I said, what what I was saying was it getting in. And one day she had a uh, school uh, laptop out or something like that. And there was like somebody had said something to her in a very mean way. And one of her responses back was something that I had instilled or I had said. And I was like blown away, like, wow, wow. So uh, parents out there, hey, keep grinding, keep doing it. And I kind of went off topic a little bit for the for fathers and moms. If our relationships don't work, they don't work out. It doesn't mean that we block and, and cut the importance of the other person out. You know, like that. I, I can't imagine have dying on that have died on that floor like I talked about and me not having been a part of their lives. Like there's such a, a, a part that's being missed that they would never get from anybody else because we're all unique. We all have our unique experiences. And as long as we're teaching them something positive and helpful and useful, where else were they going to get that from? 
So, you know, even though we, we may not agree with what our ex-wife or ex-husband or whatever or ex-boyfriend, whoever's the parent of your child, they're significant and they got a lesson to share. You know, they got a lesson to share. So uh, you know, dads out there keep doing a great job. Moms, happy belated mothers, they keep doing a great job. And kids, remember to love up and give your parents some of that love too. That's awesome, dude. Dude, I, I we could do another hour. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I, I think everybody's gonna want you back on. You were you were quite the uh, motivating and inspira inspirational um, sharer today. And and I truly do appreciate that. Not everybody can bring it with that much um, intensity and that much passion and confidence in what they're talking about. And I do really appreciate that. Where can people learn more about what you offer so that if if they want to bring you into their business or into their kid's school or or even into their personal lives, where can they find you? Uh, you evolving now.com. So Y O U evolving now.com. Uh, everything's right there. I mean, you can check out, there's some different videos you can watch. There's uh, you can go to the student and employee tab or the speaker engagement tab and all of the information is right there. Uh, you can also book a consultation with me at the pop-up. So I'd love to be able to sit down with you. Let's connect because we talked about the power of connection today. So being able to read what I do or see what I do or go on on Facebook uh, or LinkedIn and seeing some of those videos, please check that out. That'd be awesome. But there's nothing like that face-to-face -face conversation or voice-to-voice -voice conversation. Let's connect. Let's make an impact. We could do it together. And one of the things that I love is when, when we go into a company or to a university and we do our one-on-one -on -one mentoring with their employees or we do the Evolve and Leave five-week program for their leaders and employees and we work through there, or we do our retreat or you know the quarterlies. And I'll have people come up and thank me. And I say, well, thank you, but please thank your organization because I'm a luxury. I didn't have to be here. You know, uh, when we talk, we talk about a company walking the walk of work-life harmony and leadership, they could have sent you to another boring protocol meeting to get you better at the job they pay you to do and meet their bottom line. But when you have a company or, or a university or a high school that gets it and they're looking for more for their people and they want them to have the, because what goes on outside of there is going to trickle on in here. And what trickle, what's going on at work, my wife calls me at five o'clock every day and talks about her job and the better her day was, you know, it, it's great for me too. So if we know that to be true, then let's do that. So if you're a company, if you're a university or if you are a school out there that gets it and wants to walk that walk of work life harmony, school life harmony, leadership. And when I talk about leadership, one of the things that really uh, frustrated me because at first I didn't want to do leadership because you can go to Barnes and Noble and get all the leadership books in the world. So I said, first, I want to talk about leadership from personal leadership. How do you become a leader in and of your own life first? So it makes people easier to want to follow you because they like and respect how you are, who you are. And then we add the hard leadership skills and the leader seven and seven ways to lead and all those other things. But let's, how do we do personal leadership first? So guys, I know I went on about that. Thank you for your time and letting me share some stuff with you today and being with you. I appreciate it. Dude, you're the best. Don't go anywhere. We're going to stay online once I end the show, but don't go anywhere. No, Everybody, thank you. Thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. My special guest today was Andre. He is the man. Please go to his website. I'll put everything into the comment section on Facebook um, for his website and, and all his other uh, LinkedIn and all that stuff. So um, just know that the information he shared today is valuable. It is stuff you can take home and learn and implement in your life with your family, your kids, your, your work and school in sports, in life in general. Um, and I, I'm really thankful that he came on today and shared all that. And for God's sakes, everybody, go out and be kind to one another. God bless. Take care.